This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning. Thanks for having me uh, here today. Um, it's a true pleasure. And despite everything we do as pediatric surgeons and pediatricians, uh, one of the most common topics that we're always asked about is appendicitis. Uh, it never fails. You can go up to M&Ms, present all these complex things and problems, and everyone stays silent. As soon as there's like a wound infection for appendicitis, everyone in the audience comes up, at least in surgery, grand, in surgery M&Ms, comes up and gives their opinion and, and talks about um, appendicitis. So it's a very common topic. So, um, And it seems like I always uh, give talks on appendicitis. So first and uh, foremost, I have no disclosures to report. And uh, how did I get started with appendicitis? Uh, most of my in talks that I've given uh, many institutions are related to appendicitis. Well, as uh, uh, Dr. DeVasco mentioned, I did my residency at UC Davis um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and one of my mentors was a vascular surgeon, trauma surgeon, ICU surgeon. And basically, he, uh, in I think the early 90s, told me, uh, uh, Steve, there has not been a decent review on appendicitis for at least 20 years. I think that you should do one. So back when I was a resident, when, some, when a attending said, I think you should do one, that was an order. And I always meant, you know, we, and if he says we should do something, I always meant you. So, so I kind of got the hint. And so I looked up the, uh, what was in the literature in that time. Dr. Holcroft had the largest uh, review on appendicitis, and it was 1,000 cases, and it was exactly 20 years ago. So he knew what he was talking about, and he had this plan. Um, and then that led me during my research year to do another uh, review where we uh, reviewed 760 patients. I forget over what time frame. I think it was over a decade's worth of uh, data. And that's how I really got started. So any medical students or residents in the audience, you never know what your mentors are going to bring up and how it's going to carry you through your career even about 20 years later. So, um, so as Dr. Vasco also mentioned, I'm very interested in residency and training programs, and this is kind of the start of the new year. It's September. Uh, we had July come around, and, and we know the uh, possibilities of July effects and so forth, um, and as well as teaching institutions. So do we have any community pediatricians here? Great. And then, uh, and then uh, teaching facilities. So the, the, the big question, is care better or worse at teaching institutions in general? Does, do people really know that? answer. In general, at least for surgery, most of the complex situations, the care is the same at both community hospitals in the community and at high-end academic centers. What we find at academic centers, we tend to have a higher cost and a higher length of hospitalization. So what is that like for appendicitis? Well, we looked at this and we compared uh, uh, teaching uh, institutions to institutions uh, versus non-teaching institutions. We used the Kaiser database as well as Harbor's database. And uh, with respect to demographics, we found they were pretty similar, except at the teaching institution, we had more perforated appendicitis. Um, when we looked at non-perforated appendicitis, we found that the outcomes were the same with respect to wound infection, abscess drainage, readmission, and length of hospitalizations. So that's good. And then when we looked at perforated appendicitis, uh, the only difference was there was a slight improvement in wound infections at teaching institutions, uh, and the readmission rate was a little bit lower. So we can say at least when, when patients come here to this teaching institution or other teaching institutions, if families are concerned about residents being involved in care, we can say at least for appendicitis, we're, we're just as good or in some cases better. So that's reassuring. So what about the jo July effect? Who believes in the July effect? Anybody? We all hear about it, we all dread it, and especially with respect to surgery, we're worried about inexperienced surgical residents, and does that increase our morbidity? And that's always been a question, you know, never have surgery in July, never have it in June when they're leaving as well, because those are the two most dangerous months. So we actually looked at this as well. We compared July with all the other months, and we found there's actually no difference with respect to morbidity with wound infection, intra-abdominal abscess, and length of hospitalization. So safe to say that July has passed us, but also it's, it's safe to have surgery in July. Okay. 
So why appendicitis? Well, it's the most common surgical condition that we see. Over 70,000 children have an appendectomy each year, uh, about one in uh, 1,000 per child year. It's often misdiagnosed, and in, because of that, it's a common medical legal case. And even to this day, the management still remains controversial. Um, so I'm going to first focus on this misdiagnosed part. Um, just looking, I just did a quick Google search last night, and three things popped up right away on misdiagnosing appendicitis uh, and pediatrics. First of all, 5% of children with appendicitis missed at initial presentation to the emergency department. So one in 20 children that have appendicitis that pre present to the emergency department are missed. Um, and that was recently published, and that's cited all over the place. So that's very common. Um, as with respect to pediatricians, uh, a survey of pediatricians in 2010 showed that one of the most commonly misdiagnoses is appendicitis, and this is in the view of pediatricians. And this was um, justified by our, a real great um, journal, Parent Magazine, so you know it's, uh, it's true. Um, but the biggest thing about missing the diagnosis is that it increases the risk of perforation, we know that, and then increases the risk, uh, increases the morbidity, hospitalization, and costs. And that's pretty significant, so we all want to be aware of that. Taking this one step further, common medical legal case. Um, so we actually didn't know what that was. So we did a 30-year review um, looking at pediatric appendicitis using the LexisNexis database. Uh, it's a publicly available site of all federal court records. And we found that there were actually 236 cases during this time frame. And there were 200 or three that actually had documented cause for alleged malpractice. Uh, and the most common cause for the claim was actually a delay or failure in diagnosing appendicitis. And that had happened in 75% of patients, or cases, excuse me, claims. Uh, intraoperative negligence was only 11%, and postoperative care negligence was only in 10%. And then this is, should uh, raise everyone's attention. The most commonly named physician in these uh, lawsuits were pediatricians. So not surgeons, but pediatricians. So hopefully now I've caught your attention of why this is important. So the delay in diagnosis of the 152 cases, 62% uh, uh, went on to perforation. Postoperative complication, 24%. But the real kicker was of these, it led to 30 deaths. It's, it's still hard to believe that in this day and age we have deaths due to appendicitis. Uh, and I do a, 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 a occasionally medical legal cases for appendicitis, and unfortunately it's always something like this that le leads to a death. Intraoperative negligence, uh, again, death occurs from that only in 36% of the time. But again, it's the delay in diagnosis that's big. Um, half the cases went to trial, and if they go to trial, about two-thirds are in favor of the defense. And the median plaintiff award is about 643,000, ranging from about 150,000 to 1.25 million. And 42% um, of cases were settled, with a median settlement payment of 260,000, and only 12 were dismissed. Uh, the 14 cases were um, had indemnity payments over a million dollars. Eight were due to delay of fail or failure of diagnosing appendicitis. So as you can see, delaying the diagnosis of appendicitis is the most common cause of medical uh, malpractice lawsuits. It accounts for the majority of the largest payments, and the timely diagnosis should be focused on all specialties. Okay, with that in mind, got your attention, we're gonna go over the basics now. So the goals of today's talk is to really go over the background of appendicitis, what's the best method of diagnosing appendicitis, and the meat of the talk will be towards the uh, later half is the treatment of appendicitis, antibiotics versus surgery. Uh, and it's an interesting talk coming from a surgeon. So, so we all know that the classic clinical presentation is migrating abdominal pain from the imperi umbilical area to the right lower quadrant, associated anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, low-grade fever, local tenderness with rebound and guarding, pain with walking and jumping, uh, elevated white count with a left shift, and a urine analysis that's negative. That's classic. We all know that. All the medical students need to memorize this. When the patient presents with a classic presentation, I think we all agree that's all you really need. You should be able to proceed to the operating room for appendectomy or start antibiotics and then treat for appendicitis. Unfortunately, only about half of the patients will present with a classic presentation. It's really the other half that we need to figure out what's the best method uh, of diagnosing these patients. We want to minimize the negative appendectomy rate as well as minimize the perforation rate. We want it to be cost efficient and we want it to be safe. So 
a typical presentation. Now I've written lots of papers, debated this all the time, but it's really not that hard. I'm trying to simplify things now. And the main thing that you need to take away is that you need to have a high suspicion for appendicitis. And if you have an atypical presentation, you really just need imaging uh, in this day and age. And that's in the form of ultrasound or CT, and uh, in some institutions, possibly MRI. Uh, the other, uh, the other um, uh, diagnostic method is observation. Time will always tell whether the child has appendicitis. So going, that, going into that a little bit more, the impact of ultrasound. Well, here's a classic ultrasound finding of appendicitis. You can see the appendix is thickened. It's non-compressible. This is a longitudinal view. The, the distance is 7.3 millimeters. We consider anything six millimeters or larger consistent with appendicitis. Here's it in transverse view, that classic target sign that's mentioned. We know the advantages, there's no radiations, it's non-invasive, it's cheap, it's portable, it can be performed quickly. Disadvantages, again, we all know this, it's extremely operator dependent. Factors such as obesity, bowel gas pattern, movement can affect the results. And the, the, real, the real issue is if you have a normal appendix, it's hard to see it, it's hard to find. And, um, in best studies, the specificity is up to 96%, but the sensitivity is only 86%. Uh, unfortunately, the appendix is not visualized in up to 50% of studies, and that's the real problem. Because when the appendix is not visualized, even though it'll often be reported no other signs of appendicitis, we have to interpret that as we didn't get the study. It doesn't matter if there's nothing else in that study. If you don't see the appendix, you can't tell if it's positive or negative. It's an indeterminate study, and you treat it like you don't have a study at all. And then the other thing is there, there are false positive results because we're only usually using size criteria to determine appendicitis. So looking at problematic results, this was a prospective study done in, in Canada in children less than 18 years old. So again, if it's negative, you see a normal appendix, it's good. You rule out appendicitis. If it's positive, and again, it's okay, it's, it's actually, remember, there's still about a 15% false positive rate. But the key thing to pick up to this, to a definitive diagnosis based on ultrasound is, occurs in less than 50% of patients. And more than 50% of patients, you don't get the result that you need. And if you don't visualize the appendix, there's still, and they say there's no other findings consistent with appendicitis, there's still a 10% chance of having appendicitis. If they say it's inconclusive, they may see some signs like free fluid or other things that they think they're consistent with appendicitis but don't see the appendix, it's, there's a, about a 70% chance of appendicitis. So you can see these are problematic results. The other thing that we found in uh, ultrasound, we found in our review and other clinical studies, is that the, those high results that you see are those very high specificity and sensitivities. Um, really sometimes only occur when you have a well-run research study. And that's a take-home point for the residents and the medical students is a lot of times you get, when you do a great study like, like those reported, you have the best radiologists on 24-7 reading these studies and they get the greatest results. But in practice in community hospitals or other institutions where we don't have that same protocol, you're not going to duplicate that results. So in larger clinical studies, we found the accuracy of ultrasound not to be anywhere near what's best, what the best reports have shown uh, thus far. So in, in my opinion, ultrasound is a good first test to obtain, but we also may need additional studies or observation if we find a problematic result. So the obvious one is to get a CT scan. And we know that CTs are great. You can see here, this is the, the appendix. There's inflamed wall. There's fat stranding. This is appendicitis. CTs are much more accurate, 97% specificity up to 100% sensitivity. Um, early, we found that selective use of CT scans have decreased the negative appendectomy rate to 13.6% down to 8%. What's wrong with this, what's wrong with this statement now? Now we're at about 1% to 2% negative appendectomy rates, and we still want, people are still criticizing us that we should be at 0%. So, so you can see that this is older uh, studies. We all know that the radiation exposure is the big thing for, for uh, children. Uh, children are much more sensitive to radiation, particularly young girls. Uh, and unfortunately, in a lot of institutions where there's not a lot of pediatrics going on, we see adult settings used for pediatric CT scans and that's a lot more radiation than we need. 
Uh, multiple CT scans in kids linked to later cancer risk. This is all over, again, all over the internet. This was in NBC News, San Jose Mercury News, again, two highly reputable journals, um, that uh, parents are unaware that CT scans actually can increase the risk for cancer. Um, other journals have shown this as well. Um, multiple studies have shown that there's an increased risk of cancer later in life with the use of CT scans. Um, population studies have shown that there's been a significant increase in obtaining CT scans uh, prior to appendectomy. Um, in some institutions, no child goes to surgery without a positive imaging study, again, because we're trying to get to that 0% negative appendectomy rate. But at the same time, when you look over the population over the last decade, the, the actual rates of negative appendectomy and perforation rates remain unchanged despite an increased use of CT scans. And again, clinical studies, um, population studies have not confirmed the accuracy of these well-run research studies. So in, in my opinion, again, we must keep the use of CT scans in children to a minimum and then consider other alternatives. An interesting alternative that's starting to gain popularity is the use of MRI. And you can see very nice imaging here. Here's the appendix, edematous, fat stranding, all the works. Um, Contrast enhanced MRI, a retrospective review of 364 patients have shown to have a sensitivity of 96% and the specificity as well of 96%, great positive predictive value and uh, excellent uh, negative predictive value. And this is in pediatric patients. There was an interesting uh, study um, that looked at a protocol of ultrasound followed by MRI. So the ultrasound was negative, and then you proceed with MRI. Again, in a retrospective study, the at negative appendectomy rate was 1.4%. They had 100% sensitivity, 99% specificity, and you can see the outstanding a positive predictive and negative predictive value. Um, the, this uh, group also looked at um, Time. Uh, this group actually looked at patients. They did them as, as young as five years of age. And they also went ahead and looked at, I seem to be missing a slide, looked at time from presentation and to diagnosis. And they compared CT scan with this ultrasound followed by MRI. And they found the time of diagnosis was exactly the same. So again, if we have readily available MRI, um, we can do this in young patients. And they did not need sedation for their MRIs. Um, as you know, though, MRIs are not readily available 24-7. Uh, and uh, so the others, including myself, actually favor observation. So if you, when I gave this talk, Grand Rounds at Davis, 15 years ago after our review, we actually said observation we shouldn't do. We should be trying to image these patients. Now, going full circle, uh, observation works great. Uh, IV hydration, serial exams, and uh, so you, and then you, then you, uh, can try to avoid the use of the CT scan. So kind of, again, simplifying it, patient of abdominal pain, uh, low-risk patients work up for other causes, high-risk patients, immediate surgery, consult, those are our typical presentations. Unfortunately, half will be in the medium risk. First thing, ultrasound, inconclusive. Uh, obviously, if it's positive, you get the surgery consult negative, you, you work up for other causes. If it's inconclusive, then in, uh, you either need more imaging or observation. That's all you really need to tell the parents. Um, risk factors. So how do we determine those risk factors? I mentioned medium risk factors. There's a lot of ways to determine that. You can use the Alvarado score, pediatric appendicitis score, or the uh, uh, Harbor UCLA emergency department criteria score. Alvarado score came out in the 80s. It's for both adult and pediatric patients, and you can see that it's based on signs, symptoms, and labs. Pretty much outlining the patient I first presented. And it scores them, and if, you're, if you accumulate one to four points, it's low risk of appendicitis, seven or higher is high risk, and then in the medium risk, five to six, uh, those are the ones you're probably gonna need additional imaging on. For kids, we have the pediatric appendicitis score. The only thing that's really changed is we took away a point for the lab value, and we added a cough jump tenderness, uh, and that has two points. And again, low risk is one to two, greater than or equal to seven is high risk, 
medium risk is three to six. That patient I presented with classic pre presentation to start the talk off actually had all 10. So you can see that that patient doesn't need any additional imaging. Um, Harbor UCLA Emergency Department did a uh, prospective study and validated this. They, they created a, a low risk with a normal white count, no left shift, no bands, and absence of guarding or tenderness. High risk had a high white count with left shift, presence of guarding or tenderness, and pain for more than uh, uh, 13 hours. Um, and if they um, had neither of these, they were a medium risk. Again, about 50% of those patients fell on the medium risk. Uh, when they prospectively evaluated this, there was no cases of misappendicitis, and the negative appendectomy rate was like 2%. So regardless of what you use, just remember this algorithm, high suspicion, medium risk, ultrasound, and then offer the, the parents observation versus CT scan or MRI. Okay, moving on. Um, appendectomy, gold standard for the treatment of appendicitis. So should we do it open, should we do a laparoscopic, and then now I think some of you are seeing that we do it also single incision, so what, what is the best? Um, even up until the uh, early, uh, you know, middle of the last decade, advantages of lap appy remain controversial. The, there was a meta-analysis that showed that there was, a, there, there was decreased morbidity associated with laparoscopic appendectomies. Um, however, in the prospective studies, there was actually no difference uh, between the outcomes of laparoscopic versus open appendectomies. And what made things worse is even when you pulled all of the prospective studies in this meta-analysis, um, the, it was under power to even make any comments or conclusions based on which is a better operation. Um, and if then you look at large database studies, um, Dr. Chen was a resident, he did, this with, he did this study with Dr. Shu, and what they found when they looked at the Oshpot database and it had over 100,000 patients in this study, they found that there was actually an increased post-operative abscess rate in laparoscopic appendectomies. So uh, unfortunately, it was such a large study, it might have been overpowered because the clinical difference was less than 1%, but it became statistically significant. So again, it makes things a little hard to figure out what's the best operation. So we, we did a retrospective study over a 10-year time period, and we looked at all the hospitals in the Kaiser's Southern California database, and we wanted to look at the outcomes for lap appy versus open appy. And we had over uh, 7,600 patients, uh, 3,500 had lap appies, and uh, 4,000 had open. Uh, we found that there was a significant increase in the use of laparoscopic appendectomy in children from 22% to 70%. Nowadays, it's nearly 100%. Taking uh, all comers, univariate analysis, we found that in lap appies, there were, the age was a little bit older, uh, fewer male patients. Uh, the perforate, we, uh, laparoscopic appendectomy was op used for less perforated patients. Uh, the wound infection rate was lower on the univariate analysis, as was, uh, and the abscess drainage was the same. Uh, Re-emission rates were also lower in the laparoscopic group, and uh, length of hospitalization, although statistically significant, wasn't clinically different. Obviously, this is not this is a univariate analysis, and the perforation rate throws things off. So we we, we broke them down um, and did a multivariate an analysis, and the only thing that came out with respect to wound infection was that obviously if you had a perforated appendicitis, it increased your risk of wound infection by fourfold. But if you had a laparoscopic approach, the wound infection rate was lower. And we looked at abscess drainage. Again, in, at least in our study, uh, we found that, a lap, that using a laparoscopic approach actually decreased the risk of an abscess formation following um, lap apis. Looking at uh, length of hospitalization, uh, we did a linear regression and laparoscopic ap appendectomy actually decreased length of hospitalization. And then most recently presented our meeting last year and soon to be published is a prospective randomized trial um, by Dr. Bliss who's over at CHLA at this time. And he looked at all, wound, all surgical site infections, both wound infection and intra-abdominal abscesses. And what, uh, what him and his group found was that laparoscopic uh, approach significantly decreased wound infection and abscess formation. Uh, operative time um, was actually shorter now for laparoscopic appendectomy than open. Uh, he also found that there was no difference in postoperative pain requirements, time to tolerate a diet, other complications, length of hospitalization, readmissions, and uh, missed days of school uh, after discharge. 
single incision. Um, you can buy ports that have the that you can put all the port, all the instruments through the umbilicus. The feet's down here, heads up here. It's the patient's right side, left side. Or you can just put one trocar in and then just put everything through the umbilicus, find the appendix, and just pull it out through the umbilicus, and then just do an open appendectomy. This is a result. Uh, this is immediately post-op on this patient. You can see everything was done through the umbilicus. There's no scars. So. People are advocating single incision laparoscopic uh, appendectomy. I think we do some here. Some of the surgeons do some here. Um, there was actually a prospective randomized trial looking at lap, traditional lap appy versus single incision. And there was no difference with respect to wound infection or abscess, uh, no difference in length of hospitalization or hospital chargers. The single incision uh, took was just a little bit longer to do. And then the kicker, for me at least, an 18-month follow-up of this prospective randomized trial, um, because the only reason to do the single incision is for cosmesis. It's a harder operation. It takes longer. Um, but the follow-up showed that at 18 months, there's no differences in cosmetic outcome. So um, in summary, lap apis is the new standard of care for children with acute appendicitis. OK, what about antibiotics and appendicitis? If you ask uh, uh, 10 surgeons what to use for uh, uh, antibiotics and, and perioperative management of appendicitis, you'll get 10 different opinions, and everyone's confused. And um, uh, our hospitalists can, can uh, agree with that. So what, what do at least the data show? So uh, as part of our American Pediatric Surgical Association Outcomes Committee, we performed a systematic review um, and wanted to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And so for the residents out there, we, we each paper that we reviewed, we, we classified the level of evidence based on one, two, or three. One is a prospective randomized trial or a meta-analysis of prospective randomized trials. Two is a prospective study without randomization or large retrospective analysis on clearly reliable data. Three is about 99% of the literature is, is retrospective reviews and expert analysis. Once we classified the data and we made a recommendation, the recommendation was graded based on the level of evidence. And a, a grade A recommendation is the best you can get, obviously, and it's based on two or more large class one studies. Grade B is one large class one study. Grade C, small randomized trials with uncertain results. Uh, again, D and E are, are bottom of the barrel and, and really don't add much. So the first question is, what perioperative antibiotics should be used for patients with non-perforated appendicitis? And uh, really, that patient should receive one dose of preoperative broad-spectrum antibiotics. It could be single agent, double agent, triple agent. It just needs to be broad-spectrum. And it only needs to be one dose. You don't need any more after surgery. And that dose significantly decreases wound infection and abscess formation. And that's a, sorry, that might have passed, but that's a grade A recommendation. Okay, so I think we all know that. Here's just the, the confirmation with data. Antibiotics versus placebo, wound infection rates much lower. Again, with abscess formation, much lower. Where it gets tricky is those with perforated appendicitis. And these are patients retreating with appendectomies. So what perioperative IV antibiotics should be used? Traditionally, we based everything on triple antibiotics for 10 days. Um, but now, any single agent or double agent broad spectrum antibiotic is effective and more cost effective than triple antibiotics. That's a grade B recommendation. Specifically, what we found is a combination of ceftriaxone and metroni uh, metronidazole, which you can give on a single daily uh, dose, um, in prospective randomized trials showed that it was more efficient, more cost effective, and, 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 and resulted in similar uh, postoperative surgical site infections. Uh, Piperacillin and tazobactam, same results. More cost effective and similar outcomes. So you can use any of these. So it really doesn't matter which antibiotics anymore. I like to simplify it by not having the nurses give antibiotics all the time with triple antibiotics. Um, so I usually use single dose uh, ceftriaxone and, and metronidazole. How long should an perioperative antibiotics be administered? Um, this is now a grade A recommendation because over the last year we had another prospective randomized trial come out. Um, again, traditionally it was based on 10 days, uh, but now we should really base it on clinical criteria. And that's the patient being afebrile for 24 hours, return of GI function, and pain is controlled. That's actually the grade A recommendation. You don't actually need to check the lab. I think most of us do, but you don't need to check the normal white count or differential. And then should oral antibiotics be used? 
grade B is you should only use the oral antibiotics if your IV course is less than five days. Okay, so that's one study showed that that uh, patients ready to go home after perforated appendicitis on day three. Don't keep them around just because you think they need more antibiotics. Send them home, but in that patient, complete a one-week course of oral antibiotics. Okay, now to the third part of the talk, appendectomy. Is appendectomy still the gold standard for the treatment of appendicitis? So first we're gonna tackle perforated appendicitis. That's a little bit more clear. So, uh, and the reality is that there are a few surgical problems that generate more debate than the management of perforated appendicitis. This was the president from our American Pediatric Surgical Association uh, being quoted in the, in the Wall Street Journal. So. so, the management of perforated appendicitis, we know that immediate appendectomy has been the gold standard. I just showed you the laparoscopic appendectomy is now the new gold standard for the treatment of appendicitis. Non-operative management has been used much longer than the 80s. It was really used in the, in the Navy and, and patients who, uh, you know, in the submarines, got appendicitis, treated with antibiotics, did fine. It became a little bit more popular in children in the 1980s in Toronto. Um, and, and really the, the treatment is to treat with antibiotics, drain the abscess, and then proceed with an interval appendectomy six to, six to eight weeks later. Uh, like I said, gained popularity popularity in the 80s, and it was originally described for advanced cases and delayed presentations. And these were all based on retrospective studies. So um, in 66 patients, the duration of pain was or symptoms were eight days, so a very delayed presentation. They managed non-operatively, initially 92% success rate and a morbidity of only 10%. And at this time, we were quoting a morbidity for surgery for perforated appendicitis was around 30%. So this is what kind of swayed people's idea of treating these patients non-operatively. Um, uh, the same group looked at interval appy versus non-operative management, and again, look, the morbidity was, lo was lower for non-operative management compared to interval appendectomy. Retrospective study, not great, because again, the, the patients probably weren't the same. You see the duration of symptoms, these in, the in, in immediate appendectomy, only four days, versus the non-operative seven days. Okay, remember, this is for delayed presentation. Um, we looked at a large database study um, to see if there was a, you know, to get more patients in this. Um, we looked at complications, readmissions, hospital charges, and length of hospitalization. What we found is uh, out of 17,000 patients, immediate appendectomies, was still pretty much the gold standard. Only 400 patients underwent non-operative management. Well, interesting, we found that the length of hospitalization was longer for non-operative management. This is both on the initial hospitalization as well as uh, after the interval appendectomy, the cumulative and uh, hospitalization. Much more expensive for non-operative management. Uh, home health care was higher for non-operative management. Re readmission rate was higher. Um, uh, no difference in recurrent abscess formation. Um, but the complication rate was actually lower in the non-operative management group. So there is some benefit, but all the others don't really come true. Uh, Dr. Blakely um, did a prospective randomized trial. Single institution, 130 patients, about half immediate appendectomy and half non-operative management. The main outcome for this study was time away from normal activity and morbidity. In the immediate appendectomy group, um, actually did better than the non-operative group. Length of hospitalization is shorter, and the morbidity was less in the immediate appendectomy group. The, uh, uh, the controversy is the big difference in populations. Remember, this was, the, the problem, as you can see, is this form of treatment is originally meant for patients with delayed presentation, and as all of us wanted to do, we wanted to apply it to every patient with a suspected perforated appendicitis. So in this group, the, the duration of symptoms is only three days. I think all of us would agree if a patient presented with three days of symptoms, even if they're perforated, that patient would benefit from an operation. So again, even though it was a nice prospective randomized trial, that's the biggest uh, downside of the study was it really didn't address the patient population we wanted it to. So kind of summarizing non-operative management for perforated appendicitis, we know it increases cost, longer, it leads to longer length of hospitalization, it leads to increased time to return to normal activity, but it does decrease post-operative or intraoperative complications. 
uh, in summarizing everything, I think it's best for patients who present with seven days or longer of symptoms. If they present with less than seven days, uh, in my opinion, that patient would benefit from immediate appendectomy. Okay, now the, the real meat. Can we do non-operative management for acute appendicitis? So I think we all know by now, after this talk, de delay in diagnosing is bad. Uh, but I do want to point out a delay in diagnosis is not the same as a delay in surgery. Uh, back in the days of rushing a patient to the operating room once they're diagnosed no longer exists. That's not true. We don't need to do that. We, know we now know that once we start to administer the antibiotics, that's the key. Antibiotics will stop the disease progression. So a uh, patient comes in at 10 p.m. and I can operate at 7 a.m. I'd much rather operate at 7 a.m. My bedtime's 9 p.m., I don't know, but uh, anyways. Not that you all needed to know that, but you look like you're kind of dozing off, but anyways. Um, so I'd rather operate, but there's actually no difference in that delay. That patient won't proceed to, to perforation as we all used to think that would happen. Um, that's been backed up. There's no association of time to OR and risk of perforation. A delay in, in 24 hours does not increase the risk of perforation or other adverse effects. We looked at our experience at Harbor. We looked at only patients 12 years and younger, 500 patients, and we found that actually because of OR availability and other issues at our institution, what we found was that the, the mean time to the operating room was 12 hours. Um, and then we looked at time of, of, was that a factor, and it did not lead to an increased perforation rate, nor did it lead to increased surgical side infections. Um, what are the risk factors for perforation? We, after, in this analysis, multivariable analysis, looking at every possible thing we could, the only two things that came up that increases the risk for perforation are age and symptom duration greater than 24 hours. Uh, you got an odds ratio of 5.2. So in, in the perforation, uh, penicillin perforation is a pre-hospital event. It's not a post-hospital event. Uh, anecdotal observations, again, if I'm called in the middle of the night and I schedule the operation the next day, um, I then see them and I'm before surgery and I'm actually shocked at how well they're doing. They got admitted, they got antibiotics, uh, IV fluids, and the majority of these patients look great. And I have to like double check, am I, is this the right patient? Is this, uh, you know, I look at the labs, look at the ultrasound, they have a kid had appendicitis, um, but they look great. They have no pain, they want to eat, and the parents are like, do we have to do surgery? I'm like, you have appendicitis, we have to do surgery. So we do, the appendix is clearly inflamed, take it out, they feel fine, they go home the next day. But the real question from this, if they look so good, do they really need an operation? Can we get by with just the antibiotics? So um, the problem is that we've all, we all have ingrained in us that appendectomy is the mainstay treat, of treatment for acute appendicitis. And antibiotics has only been considered a bridge to surgery. We've never really considered it as treatment for acute appendicitis. And this has really been overlooked based on tradition, not on evidence. Um, other inflammatory processes in the abdomen, such as diverticulitis, are mostly managed with antibiotics alone. So um, looking at antibiotics versus uh, surgery, if you have a diagnosis of radiographic evidence of acute appendicitis, no appendicolith, and no evidence of perforation, you can consider treating these patients with antibiotics alone. Meta-analysis of this, there's been four uh, prospective randomized trials, um, mostly in adults. One of the studies had children uh, enrolled, uh, and their primary outcome at the, in this meta-analysis was complications. Their secondary outcomes was length of hospitalizations, readmissions, and efficacy of treatment. They found that using antibiotics alone, the complication rate was lower, the odds ratio of 0.69, and there was no difference in length of hospitalization between um, uh, appendectomy uh, versus uh, antibiotics. However, the treatment e efficacy in this study was only 63%. So 63% were treated successfully. That ranged from 44 to 85%. And then those that were treated successfully, there was a 20% recurrence rate. Um, and those that underwent an appendectomy after a recurrence, actually 6% were normal. And only 20% of, of this 20% had perforated appendicitis. And three patients underwent a second round of antibiotics. So the conclusions of the study was antibiotics can be safely used as primary treatment for uncomplicated acute appendicitis, uh, and antibiotic use is not associated with an increased perforation rate. 
So what about in children? I don't know if you, this just came out last month in Journal American College of Surgeons. It's been um, um, e-publication a couple months ago. But um, um, I think this is uh, Ohio um, Columbus Children's Hospital. They did a prospective non-randomized trial. It's really a feasibility study. And they looked at antibiotics versus antibiotics plus appendectomy. Their inclusion criteria was 7 to 17 years, less than 48 hours of symptoms, a white count less than 18,000, and radiographic evidence of non-ruptured appendicitis. Um, 30-day feasibility study, in the antibiotic arm, they gave piperacillin, tazobactam, or if they were pen allergy, ciproflagyl. Uh, they kept their children uh, NPO for 12 hours. The diet was advanced when clinically stable, and then switched to oral antibiotics and completed a 10-day course. The surgical arm went, uh, received the same IV antibiotics and uh, lap appendectomy as they normally would. They enrolled 77 patients, 30 in the antibiotic arm, 47 in the surgery uh, group. The demographics were similar, duration of pain, symptoms, method of diagnosis, and white counts were all similar between the two groups. What did they find? They found the immediate success rate um, was 93%. 28 out of 30. The two that failed, one was a, in a patient who had a carcinoid tumor and one had just run of the mill acute appendicitis. 30 day success rate uh, was 90%. One more recurred, quote, recurred and had their appendectomy out, but that patient actually had a normal appendix. So, so pretty good at 30 days, 90% success rate. Their main outcome was actually uh, shown here. Length of hospitalization was longer in hours uh, compared to surgery. Um, but the return to normal activity was significantly improved in the antibiotic arm, as was the child quality of life and the parent's um, evaluation of the child's quality of life. Both were improved um, with antibiotics versus surgery. So clearly promising data for this. So they concluded that non-operative management for uncomplicated acute appendicitis in children is feasible, has a high immediate and 30-day success rate, associated with quicker recovery, and associated with improved quality of life. So what are we working on now? Uh, we're actually working on a multi-institutional prospective randomized trial. It includes all of you, Harbor, uh, Reagan, and um, Santa Monica UCLA. I think it's also going to include USC. Uh, and uh, it's still in the planning stages. Planning stages mean we've been trying to get this underway for about two years now. Um, our first step is we're going to survey uh, patients and families whether, they're, would, whether they would actually be willing to participate in such a study. So all these institutions, we just got IRB approval for this. So we're going to be surveying parents with, you know, when they have appendicitis, would they actually want to be enrolled in this. Some fear that if you can just be treated with antibiotics, they don't want to enroll in a, in a trial. They just want antibiotics. They don't want surgery. So we need to see if they're willing to enroll in the study. And then at the same time, pilot studies are starting, uh, both at all of you and Harbor. Um, at Harbor, uh, our goal is to determine the risk factors for failure of antibiotic therapy. We're going to include three years or anyone down to three years old. Um, and we're not going to have radiographic evidence. If we think the surgeon thinks the patient has appendicitis, they'll be enrolled. Um, they have to not be pregnant, and they have to be able to give consent. We have a long list of exclusion criteria, it's pretty obvious ones. And we're going to get initial labs, pain score um, for pediatric population. We're going to do this both in adults and children. For our group, we're going to do pediatric appendicitis score, antibiotics, NPO, reevaluate in 12 to 24 hours. If they're improved, we're just going to continue treating them with antibiotics. Uh, and then we'll do the total of 10 day course. If there are worse or no improvement, we'll offer appendectomy. This will be our follow-up schedule. And if they choose not to enroll in our study, we'll just treat them the tra traditional way with IV antibiotics and appendectomy. And we'll prospectively collect the data and see how they, they pan out. So that's in the works. We're, uh, that's submitted to the IRB, and hopefully we'll be starting the study soon. The difference with our study is we're going to, uh, we don't need radiographic evidence of appendicitis. Uh, we will include patients with a pentacolith, uh, and um, we'll go as low as three years old. So just going to end with this. Uh, this was over at Santa Monica UCLA. This is a, a friend of my son's, a good friend of my son's, and uh, he had acute appendicitis, and he was admitted on June 24th, 2014. And, um, 
and so we admitted him. The problem was he's on my son's volleyball team, and they had national championships. This was a Tuesday in Houston on Saturday, and he's like one of the star players. And we're like, what can we do? And he was really sad he couldn't play in this national championship tournament. And he says, is there anything we can do? And I go, well, there's this, you know, we can try IV antibiotics, see how you do with it. So we treated him with IV antibiotics. This is him the next day. And then um, we switched him to orals, and uh, he went home on the 26th which was a Thursday. He flew out Saturday to Houston, the national championship is my son, I had to get him in here, and <laughs> here he is playing by Sunday. So this is an advantage of non-operative management. If, he, if I had operated on him, he would have been out for at least two weeks. So in conclusion, um, delay in diagnosis for appendicitis must be avoided. Limited workup is required for patients with a classic presentation of appendicitis. Use of imaging studies and or observation for patients with an atypical presentation is needed. Laparoscopic appendectomy is a preferred method for treating appendicitis as of today. Perioperative antibiotics with appendectomy, single dose for acute appendicitis, uh, and treat clinically for perforated appendicitis. Antibiotics halts the progression of, of the disease process for appendicitis. Uh, a delay in surgery does not increase the risk of perforation or other adverse events. And antibiotics may be used to treat acute non-perforated appendicitis, uh, and that'll be confirmed with prospective studies that will be starting shortly. I'd like to thank you and answer any other questions.